Well, Mark, here we are again. Yeah. Let's start. Good to have you back, by the way, Johnny. That's very yeah. nice of you. Thank you very much. Nice surprise getting you back tonight. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's start with the hot news. Is this light at the end of a long tunnel, or is it another false dawn? Are fans on their way back to Fratton Park? I think it's part of a wider picture really in society in general is this that the you know the light at the end of the tunnel or is it a false dawn it's something something that's not unique to football we're sort of caught in the in the whirlwind of what's going on with you know society in general um what do i think i think it could be you know because if you look at what i think there's a general feeling amongst the government in the lead up to hopefully the vaccine now there seems to be a um an easing of the restrictions if Gyms, as an example, can open up across all three tiers. Um, shops, even non-essential shops now, can reopen across all three tiers. So there does seem a general relaxation, which, you know, as long as it's safe to do so for football and specifically, it is great news. Um, hopefully we're not in tier three. We're, we'll hopefully find that out imminently. Um, but we're ready to go, subject to obviously getting all the the permissions in place that's required from the SGSA safety advisory group in our own health and safety internal department. So are we talking Peterborough home? Potentially. Um, as I say, I hate to comment on things that are outside of my control, um, but we are ready as a club. It's just really is everyone else ready because this news did sort of come out of the blue. I think if you read the statement from the EFL last night, they were slightly caught off guard by it as well. Um, so it wasn't anything that we had any pre-notice on other than just seeing it um, as with the rest of the country, you know, evolve on TV live yesterday. Several Premier League clubs don't seem too enamoured by it. They're saying it doesn't pay, but surely it's more than that. And I think, yeah, I think it's the sentiment of allowing fans back in that really matters. And, and we've always said whether it be 500, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, whatever it might be, I think it's symbolic, mm. you know, supporters being allowed back into grounds. And as you say, hopefully the light at the end of the tunnel that it will now progress further and, and there'd be even more easing leading into that time when the vaccine becomes available. But I do have to stress, you know, there's been a lot of obviously sad losses during this period. So we don't want to just run away and it's, it's just about football, just about getting fans back. It all, all has to be done, even with an easing of the restrictions in a safe, manageable way that ensures that when people do come, not only is it safe and secure, that they feel safe and secure. OK, on we go. Now, sadly, final floodlight is down. Yeah, sadly. Why is that sad? A lot of people sentimental. Oh, no, we still got one up in the car park. Yeah, yeah. We did keep that. Yeah. <laughs> do you understand the sentiment? I do it? Understand, yeah. I fully understand the sentiment. When uh, I was a kid and you used to go around the country or whatever, what would you look for? The floodlights, you know, and then it was, like, I want to go and see the stadium. But yeah, the floodlights were symbolic. At the, well, symbolic even now, really. And to me, football, four stands, four floodlights. Yeah. Anyway, sentiment aside, now it's down. Mm -hmm. Will work commence on the Milton end, or are we still waiting on network rail? Yeah, the, the, the coming down of the final floodlight was never really anything other than, than as you, we say, symbolic in, in the work that we're doing and bringing the stadium up into you know the 21st century. But in regards of the Milton end, which is part of bringing the stadium even further into the 21st century, um, there's a lot of other things at play um, which form part of the overall master plan, which we have always been clear about from day one when releasing the plans. It is dependent on the wider picture and knowing that we are going to be getting that help and support. So it's not just the Milton End in isolation, it's that we can fulfil our ambitions and our dreams for Fratton Park and the wider area, you know, um, sometime in the very near future. On to players, when will but we... I've just got to stress again, it's not in our hands. There's a lot of external, mm. I hate using the word, stakeholders, but network rail, highways agencies, our local residents, the local council, the government even. There's a lot of people that need to really be on board with us to actually realise our ambitions for the stadium. They don't move quickly, things like and that. And they don't move quickly, especially during this time. When will we be giving players who are out of contract next summer new deals? A lot depends on really the salary cap rules. Um, pretty much every player I've spoken to now um, in regard who are out of contract at the end of the season, they know the current situation of what we can go to from a, a regulation point of view. Naturally, none of them are that happy to sign on what the salary cap are. They'd much rather wait, 
see how the arbitration goes, potentially a court hearing after that, not us by the way, the PFA with the EFL. So there's a lot of, um, there's a, a lot of bridges to cross before we can go back and offer contracts to our existing players that are out of contracts at the end of this season that are aligned or maybe even better than, than what they're currently on. But at this moment in time, you know, I've discussed with them what the salary cap means, what we can afford to pay, and there's not a lot of appetite to sign prior knowing what the outcome of the uh, salary cap arbitration is. Sure, I suppose Kenny Jackett's contract also to be negotiated at the end of the season. Again, that's, uh, I mean, that's technically, you know, we always say that is private between ourselves and Kenny. Um, and, you know, we, we, I'm in touch with Kenny literally every day, not always about his contract, by the way, very rarely about his contract. But, yeah, obviously we're aware that Kenny's out of contract at the end of the season and that's, that's something we align with the players we're, we're quite relaxed about at the moment. Could future free I follow games for flexi season ticket holders and Pompey members be left open for use on any game? There are two flexi season ticket holders in my household and therefore one code was unused. Yeah, I mean, if that was a real gift from us as a club, if you look at as a, as a one-off so that people could experience I follow, and people had been having issues earlier on in the season. But on a regular basis, giving out free I follow passes when that is the only source of revenue that we've got coming in just doesn't add up for us. Um, if you look at, I think we are unique, maybe there's one or two other clubs, I believe, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, that didn't go full price for their season tickets this year, but many other clubs went full price for their season ticket and have been giving iFollow um, as a to replicate the income from it. So where they paid, you know, in their season ticket to come to every match because they've not been able to attend because of COVID, they've had a free iFollow pass, you know, per game. We took the decision. We didn't feel it was right to charge people full price for a season ticket, and then if they couldn't come in go down the give the free I follow pass route. Um, it was up to people where they paid on a, mm -hmm. you know, um, a game by game basis. And unfortunately, when you go in this particular person's case, it's not everyone's going to win on that. There are going to be some losers. And we gave the th free pass away for a particular game. If it wasn't used, it's not something that can be carried over into future games. Okay, doke. Right, uh, one about the AstroTurf around the pitch and the risk of slipping in that area. Is there any likelihood that that is going to be changed to grass? And I brought up with you off camera. I remember as a kid, there used to be orange grit going around the side of the pitch and we used to wipe our hands on it and it used to be all over our hands. That's right, yeah, I remember that as well. Um, so to answer the question, in the immediate future, no. Um, it seems that pretty much every club I go to or, or that I see on TV now has the AstroTurf around the outside. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, it's you know, in regards of when, when you get people warming up, the linesmen and it becomes a mud bath and, and all that. So there's a general sh shift that has been over recent years to AstroTurf and we've got no plans that I'm aware of to, t to turn that back to grass. So AstroTurf is the lesser of the evils, you say? It could be, yeah. I mean, there's, there's the perfect solution will be perfect grass for every game. But unfortunately, you know, we don't haven't got that technology 100% there at the moment. And, and even the premiership clubs, you know, your you big clubs in Europe, they do have the AstroTurf around the outside. Yeah. Will there be any investment into a 4G pitch at the training ground or a dome? Something we've been considering for a while now. Um, as, you, as you know, we, we're leaseholders, long-term leaseholders at Roco. We don't own the free old and um, we've been working with Claire on her project that will produce two 4G pitches. Um, which is, is great and you know we're, we're working towards that hopefully concluding very soon obviously with Claire and under management and control which has been fantastic by the way but specifically for our academy one will probably not be enough if we're going to do it we need two and it's actually just finding the right place that we own where we can develop it and have two 4G pitches of our own for our first team and, and primarily for the academy because the first team are not you know, they train on an Astro in the event of bad weather, but they would normally train on grass where, you know, the kids growing up there, they very much are used to training on AstroTurf week in, week out, and even playing their games on them. Talk of appealing the restrictions on squad numbers has gone quiet. Have we meekly accepted that we are playing with a 22-man squad for the whole season? Well, it's not our decision. You know, we've fought against the, the salary cap and the squad cap 
Um, less so with the squad cap, I have to say, because there's no point in arguing for an increase in squad size if you're still constrained by what you can spend in it via the, the salary cap. So we have probably been the most vocal, uh, most on the front foot in working even to a degree, even with the PFA, in, in identifying the failings of the current salary cap rules. Um, and we're still hopeful that we can get that overturned. And, but at the moment, the priority really is the salary cap, not the squad cap, because a 22-man squad that, by the way, goes back to 20 even next season, so even more restrictive, it's, it's sort of an irrelevance if you haven't got it aligned with the salary cap because there's no point in saying, OK, well, you can have as many players as you want and then you've still got the salary cap because you just further dilute what you can spend on each individual player anyway. So it hasn't meekly disappeared, rather it's... it's it hasn't ongoing. meekly disappeared. It's never really... Our, our focus has always been on the salary cap. So the actual salary cap, in, as in what we can spend is, in our opinion, the major issue because without addressing that first, the, the salary squad size is, is an irrelevance because, mm. as I said, it's, you're going to be governed by what you can spend anyway. So it was the Checker Trade Trophy when we won it. Now it's the Papa John's Trophy final. When is it likely to be played against Salford or is it? <laughs> it's back to the general picture in, in society. It's not something that Portsmouth can control, Salford can control the EFL. It's really a government decision for, I have to tell you, for months our strategy was let's try and get fans in there, you know, let's hold off. We're going to keep ploughing on, ploughing on as long as we can to make sure that we give supporters the opportunity to at attend a final at Wembley. How great would that be at the moment? Now, I think I said in my last Q&A last month that we are now... And we, we, we're going to talk to Sulfan and the EFL on this. Um, I'm not preempting that conversation, but I get a, a stronger sense every day now that the fans maybe, you know, are, are willing to sort of accept that maybe the final will have to take place behind closed doors. And as soon as that decision is taken, we will be obviously giving a refund to fans. Why not share the trophy? So much has changed. I in would, I would, I would, I'd rather play the game behind closed doors and share a trophy. Would you? Mm, yeah, you either win or lose a trophy, you don't share it. It's just my opinion. OK, well, it's been a strange kind of season. In fact, it's been a strange kind of two <laughs> yeah. seasons. Uh, I think that's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you happy with the progress? Of the club? Yeah. I am. Um, I'm happy with the progress in regards of just managing to stay afloat at this time and not racking up huge debts you know that we're going to have to carry forward to future years by you know the generosity of our ownership and board um, the way we've conducted ourselves as a, as a club our squad how we're playing at the moment there are a lot of positives but it's hard to really paint a positive picture when our main source of income has completely dried up for the last eight months um, you know and the, the whole business and of, of football and why we come here, the camaraderie, the passion, the atmosphere hasn't been there. So it is hard to be positive, but we keep working, doing what we're doing. You know, we work very hard at what we do. Our staff work hard on and off the pitch. You know, our ownership group work hard in what we're trying to achieve. But to come out of this, hopefully sometime in the very near future, having made, you know, still kept the staff exactly as it is, you know, to still hopefully remain debt-free during that period and to look forward to what will be a bright new world moving forward should the vaccine prove to be successful. Yeah, I'm very positive. I'll bring that up because it's something that's not really highlighted. We're still here, nine months We're later. We're still here and I speak to a lot of clubs that are borrowing from, you know, X, Y and Z entity just to stay afloat. We've been thoroughly and fully supported by our owners throughout this pandemic and, and continue to do work, you know, and continue to look for new opportunities. And, you know, some of those hopefully will come off as soon as the restrictions are lifted, the vaccines there, and we can forever be rid ourselves of, the, of this terrible period in not just the club's history, but in, you know, the history of the world. OK, there we are. Another good 20 minutes or so. We must do it again soon. All right. Thank you. Great to see you again, James. Thank you.